This is CBC Nova Scotia News. Tonight, tenants displaced. More than 35 people are forced from their homes after two new Glasgow buildings are condemned. Being prepared, communities hit by Nova Scotia's biggest ever wildfire get ready for the next emergency. And in the house, curling fans from around the world celebrate their sport in Sydney. A quiet start to the weekend, but our next storm rolling in throughout the day on Saturday with snow changing to rain and a lot of it. Your full forecast is coming up. Good evening. We begin with breaking news out of the UK on the health of Catherine, the Princess of Wales. She has cancer. Catherine appeared in a video released earlier today. Here is some of what she said. In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London, and at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. My medical team therefore advised that I should undergo a course of preventative chemotherapy, and I'm now in the early stages of that treatment. Catherine said the diagnosis came as a huge shock and that she and Prince William have been doing everything they can to manage it privately for the sake of their young family. Catherine went on to say it has taken time to recover from major surgery and for her and William to explain it to their three children in an appropriate way and reassure them that their mother is going to be okay. Catherine also asked for privacy as she completes her treatment. The type of cancer was not disclosed. We'll have more on this story coming up later in the show. More than 35 people in New Glasgow are now homeless after the town put notices on two buildings because they failed fire safety inspections. As we hear in this report from the CBC's Paul Palmiter, the local homeless shelter is full, so many of them have nowhere to go. It is known in New Glasgow as the American House. Its origin dates back to the 1800s, but this week plywood was slapped over its windows and doors because of safety reasons. Tried to work with the property owner, um, but uh, things kept deteriorating with the properties and it got to a level where uh, it was no longer safe to leave people sleeping in those buildings. Two buildings belonging to John Tomlick have been shut down. The orders to vacate and close have been posted on each of them. Tomlick, who is in his 80s, lived on the ground floor of one of the buildings. He and several tenants had to quickly pack their belongings and leave their homes on Wednesday. If you know that a building is dangerous and something happens the next day and you haven't done anything about it, um, that, that's I, technically, I guess you would be liable for that. As a, as a municipality. While the number of tenants is believed to be less than 10, there were numerous other people who had been staying in the buildings. There were seven paying tenants in that building and approximately 27 squatters. Lisa DeYoung operates New Glasgow's only shelter and it's directly across the street from the American House. She would like to offer overnight lodging to those displaced at her facility, but overnight all of these beds are full. Unfortunately, there were some folks that, that did end up having to find a camping site. There were some that slept in bank entrances and there was others that just kind of walked the neighborhood and there was another fellow that ended up at the hospital. Paul Boudreau quickly threw his things in a backpack when he had to move out. He lived in the American house for the last 12 years. Well, it's always been uh, pr like the Wild West in there, but the last couple of years there's been a lot of uh, what you call bad element, uh, IV drug users, drug dealers, thieves, uh, people that just uh, damage the building. Viola's place gave Boudreau a tent and sleeping bag. The shelter was hoping the tents could be set up in their parking lot so they would be close to the other services the shelter provides for the homeless. They can still access food, showers, everything they need here. Support staff is here to help keep them safe. And then we can kind of keep eyes and ears on them to be able to assist if there's a crisis or anything like that. That plan was shot down by the town. The reason for that being is I didn't feel that um, allowing tents in that location was either a short-term or a long-term solution to what we were dealing with. The mayor says the town and the Department of Community Services are working on solutions to try and find suitable conditions 
for the people who are no longer living inside these walls. Paul Pometer, CBC News, New Glasgow. The province has sold a beleaguered health care infrastructure project to a prominent long-term care developer. The government is selling the land and construction project at 21 Hogan Court in, to Shannex for $46 million. Shannex will finish the renovations on the 68-bed building and construct a second adjacent building with 110 beds. The facility will house patients who no longer need a hospital bed but cannot return home because they're still recovering or awaiting a long-term care placement. The health minister says the move makes sense. We know there are easily over 300 people waiting now in Central Zone um, for an alternative level of care. And so this will really uh, assist in, in the flow in the system. Renovations on the former hotel site were supposed to be complete by now. The development was also the subject of a scathing Auditor General's report last month. Opposition leaders say today's announcement shows the government couldn't get the work done itself. Well, I think it's clear that the government's original plan for this wasn't a good one, and I think they're fortunate to have Shannox come in and hopefully clean up this mess and turn this into something that's going to be really valuable for patients. Why can't the provincial government get anything off the ground? Why can't this government that is dedicated to building health care, to fixing health care, actually get anything fixed or built? Shannox officials say the first building will be renovated and ready for patients by the end of the year. The second building is scheduled to be ready for patients in April of 2026. A Nova Scotia judge has extended creditor protection for the newspapers of the Saltwire Group for another seven weeks. That's to give the company time to restructure and perhaps find a new owner. The newspaper chain includes the Halifax Chronicle Herald and other newspapers in Nova Scotia, Newfoundland and Prince Edward Island. They've accumulated debts of more than $60 million and have a revenue that's only a fraction of that amount. While he has extended the protection, the judge wants more time to re review the proposed plan, so the lawyers will return to court on Monday. People fed up with frequent power outages in Cape Breton met with Nova Scotia Power at a meeting in Albert Bridge. It was one of three sessions held in the area this week to address concerns of residents. The CBC's Kyle Moore reports. If the wind blows the wrong way, we lose power. It's been happening too often since Hurricane Fiona. Power outages and plenty of them, according to residents who live in the Albert Bridge area. Every time you blinked, there's powers out. Since then, it's gone out, you know, several times and sometimes two or three days, sometimes just hours. More than two dozen people showed up at the Albert Bridge Fire Hall to voice their concerns with Nova Scotia Power, but not everyone was satisfied with the utility's response. Just wanted to know what their um, explanation was for why they can't do a better job of keeping the trees down. NSP held meetings in three different Cape Breton communities this week, Manadou, Lewisburg and here in Albert Bridge. Their message to residents, they are investing in their infrastructure. We're in a beautiful, rugged coastal environment. We're looking at a lot of trees in the area and the combination of those two things with the escalating weather, the impacts and the hangover from the devastation from Fiona has led to some reliability issues. Nova Scotia Power says it plans to spend $45 million this year on tree trimming and vegetation management. Charlene McMullen also blames a poor performing substation in the area for some of the outages. That was rated in the bottom 5% when it comes to performance. We've done quite a bit of work again already in the last three years clearing trees. We're going to do a lot more. We've also done quite a bit of work on our transmission system that was identified as something that had contributed to some of those outages. So that's been cleaned up. The CBRM councillor for the area was happy with what he heard from NSP and the overall work that has been done so far. They recognized that there was a problem and uh, now they're um, planning to fix it and we're very happy about that. NSP plans to come back in a year and meet with residents to see if their work has made a difference. Kyle Moore, CBC News, Albert Bridge. Communities in southwest Nova Scotia are gearing up to respond to emergencies this season. Last May, the area saw the largest wildfire in the province's history, causing wide-scale damage and mass evacuations. As Gareth Hampshire tells us, local municipalities and volunteer fire departments have some new tools at their disposal. 
If the volunteer firefighters in Barrington are called out to forest fires this year, they'll all have new wildland protective equipment. Their normal gear is designed for structure fires. It's a lot heavier and you can't wear that fighting wildland fires because it's too hot and you'd be overcome by heat exhaustion way, way faster. And there are more volunteers this season after a boost in numbers following the fire. When something like that happens, they, they realize that they should step up and help out. So. The wildfire burned more than 23,000 hectares in this area last year. Local authorities had never experienced anything like it before. For example, we struggled a lot with, uh, with cell coverage. Uh, within the municipality, we've got nine zones that are blackout zones, uh, so communication was, was a problem. The municipality of Shelburne's trying out a new communication alert system after challenges getting evacuation messages through to people last year when the wildfire was spreading. People will need to sign up for the program, which can send messages to landline phones, email, as well as through an app and by text messages. People who were in the zone that didn't get the notification, if ground search and rescue missed them, they could have been in a life-threatening situation. So having a tool like this saves lives. The Department of Natural Resources and Renewables is distributing additional and new equipment to its depots around the province. That's happening sooner this year because of a funding agreement between Nova Scotia and Ottawa. This investment between the provincial and federal governments has certainly allowed us to, um, to increase our cash and, and do it at a quicker pace. And it's, it's, it's going to enhance our ability to be prepared and, and respond to wildfires. The money will also help replace this fleet of helicopter water bombers over the next few years. Back in Shelburne County, recent rainfall means the ground is moist and the fire threat is low. But Dwayne Hunt says that can change quickly, and he's watching the weather conditions closely. Gareth Hampshire, CBC News, Shelburne County. All right, so a quiet Friday, but it sounds like some messy weather just on our doorstep. Yeah, that's right. A storm system that's going to be tracking in, and it will be bringing a mess to the Maritimes. Now, Nova Scotia primarily rain with this system, mostly rain. 30 to 50 millimeters could see some pots, pockets exceeding that, especially in through the south and west. But we will see some mixing, especially for northern parts of Nova Scotia. We could see it trace to as much as five centimeters of accumulation, and there is a freezing rain risk as well. But as you can see, a lot of wintry weather in through New Brunswick and into PEI if you're traveling there this weekend. Uh, you can see quiet tonight, quiet for Saturday to start the day, and then that snow will track in throughout the afternoon tomorrow. While we're not looking at a lot of accumulation, if you are traveling on the road Saturday afternoon into Saturday evening, be mindful that things could be slick, especially Colchester, Cumberland, the Northumberland Shore and into Cape Breton, especially uh, you know late afternoon into the early evening. After that pu first push of snow moves out, it is then indeed showers and then periods of rain and those winds as well will be ramping up. Note the timeline of this. It's going to be working in as we move throughout the Saturday night time period and Sunday morning. That'll be kind of when we see the meat and potatoes of the heaviest rain and the strongest winds. By noon on Sunday, western area is already clearing and the eastern half of the province will clear through Sunday afternoon with temperatures then dropping in behind. I mentioned the winds and they will be noteworthy. We're talking about those winds ramping up for Saturday night. Widespread gusts, 60, 70, even 80 kilometers per hour possibly even a little bit stronger along parts of the coast. Again, through the overnight on Saturday into early Sunday, this will be our best chance of some power outages. And again, things easing through the later stages of Sunday. Good news just in time for the Junos on Sunday night. Well, Amy. that is the silver lining, isn't it? It's some yeah. good news. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Well, investing in cryptocurrencies can be very lucrative, but there's also some risk involved, and some scammers have been taking advantage of vulnerable Canadians. Now, Nova Scotia is raising the alarm, launching a website to help warn the public about how to spot a fake. The CBC's Brett Ruskin reports. This new website is a creative way for Nova Scotia's Securities Commission to warn the public about the risks of these online crypto trading sites. They've claimed many victims, not only here in Nova Scotia, but across the country. So they made novacrypto.ca. You can go and visit the site now. It looks like one of these fraudulent 
trading websites. It, it looks like they're legitimate. They say that they guarantee profits. There's low risk. They will teach you how to trade in cryptocurrency, make a bunch of money with very little risk, and again, guaranteed profits. In fact, in making this fake website, they actually copied and pasted some of the text from the other fraudulent sites that have claimed victims in the past that people have lost money to. Here is David Harrison with the Securities Commission. One of the major red flags is typos and grammatical errors. So we actually found these actual typos. We stole them directly from their site and put them on our site. For example, there's a, a typo where you'll see the word affordable spelled with a T. We actually found that on an actual legitimate website and took it from and put it on ours. So again, clicking through this Nova Scotia Securities webpage, eventually it kicks you back over to the official webpage to explain, hey, this has been a hoax. You, If this was a, a real fraudulent website, you may have lost money. So the caution, the warning is out there, a new way to try to warn the public about it. As for recommendations for the public about ways to avoid these websites, well, there's always risks when you're handing money online for someone to trade it on your behalf in cryptocurrencies. They are saying to watch for red flags, for example, those obvious spelling mistakes, obvious grammatical errors as well. And that if you do get caught up in this scam, if you do end up losing money, it can be embarrassing, but to share your stories so that other people don't get caught in the same trap. Here's David Harrison once again. If you do become a victim of investment fraud or any type of fraud, uh, report that to regulators, tell your family about it, tell everyone about it to not only protect uh, them, but uh, if, if you don't tell me about it, th there's very little chance of you getting your money back, unfortunately. But if you tell no one, that, that chance is 0%, obviously. Now, the security concerns and the risks around these crypto trading websites has been growing in recent years. It's cost Nova Scotians, at least, more than a million dollars in the past year or so, with about half, more than 50% of the complaints going to the Securities Commission related to cryptocurrency. So again, this website is now live. You can visit novacrypto.ca to see what it looks like, this fraudulent site, and then learn more details about the risks of these trading websites. Brett Russell and CBC News, Halifax. Faculty and staff at NSCC have ratified new collective agreements. The Atlantic Academic Union, which represents over 1,000 employees, says 86% of faculty and 91% of professional support voted to accept the contracts. Workers will get a 9% raise. Improvements on working conditions were also agreed on. Voter turnout was 88% overall. Last week, the union entered a legal strike position and was expected to hit picket lines on Monday before reaching an agreement with the college. Well, it's Juno weekend in Halifax. The celebration of Canadian music will wrap on Sunday with the Juno Awards ceremony hosted by Nelly Furtado. The president of the Juno says the event is giving a big boost to the local economy. When we've been touring for the last 10 years, we throw off about $12 million of local economic impact. You know, you think about the thousands of people who are here from all across the country, musicians, the, the record industry, publishers, promoters, managers. They're taking over hotels, they're going out for dinner, they're using Ubers and taxis. So it has a significant benefit. Um, not to mention just, you know, not from across the country, but all within the Atlantic region. All the provinces are engaged. As much as we're in Halifax, this is an Atlantic region Junos. And I'll talk to Juno's president, Alan Reed, about some of the events happening around Halifax this weekend. That's our newsmaker just after 6.30. Well, as Halifax's population continues to grow, so does its music scene. But people in the local entertainment industry say the number of performance spaces aren't keeping pace. The CBC's Richard Woodbury has more. This former Dartmouth church now holds events like concerts, comedy shows, and everything in between. It's called the Sanctuary Arts Centre. Last month, it even hosted a Cantonese opera and a wrestling show. There aren't a lot of venues for people to go to. So the fact that the wrestling show and the Cantonese opera are back to back is because this was the venue that was going to work for both of them, uh, and there wasn't, there wasn't another spot to go. With its pews intact, the century-old space can hold up to 350 people. It's considered a small venue. That's something people in the local entertainment industry say is lacking in the city especially since the beginning of the pandemic. And Halifax's population is growing rapidly, but performance spaces aren't keeping pace. 
you know, this, this population of, of immigrants, refugees that we have coming to the city, they want to see shows too. And they are also filling up the venue calendar. I can attest to that. So, uh, and it's, it's fantastic. But what it means is, as you add more people, you need to add more stages. <laughs> you wouldn't know a good time if it showed up at your door. Musician Leanne Hoffman has been playing live shows for the last decade. She says with fewer places to play, she's noticed musicians playing in non-traditional spaces. Yeah, I've seen a lot of like art shows mixed with music, mixed with, you know, poetry, mixed with lots of different media types. And I think that crossing uh, over like genres of art, but also audiences is going to be so important moving forward to start to bring in new people. She says part of the reason this is happening is because of the venue shortage. And it's not just small venues. We need a proper concert hall. I'd say 2,500, 3,000 people with uh, one or two uh, balconies, which would, and it could be used for a lot of things, not just music. Uh, cities, that's the main lack, I think. With the housing shortage in Halifax, there's not a lot of optimism within the entertainment industry that the venue shortage will improve anytime soon. Richard Woodbury, CBC News, Halifax. The Women's World Curling Championships wrap up this weekend in Sydney, and some of curling's biggest fans from near and far are taking in the competition. And as Aaron Potty reports, their love of the sport means they share a special bond. Karen Bray is a die-hard curling fan who's been watching the sport for almost 50 years. She says the best part of the games is when players make big, bold moves. I love it when they get two stones close together with a little, little opening, and then they go right down the middle and they keep on doing it. Those things are so heavy, and they put them exactly where they want them to go. And that is amazing. It's a very mathematical sport. Bray says curling fans are super friendly, as people often come up to her at competitions wanting to chat or trade pins. I like the fans almost better than the people, than the <laughs> curlers, because it's great fun to see where all the people are coming from, and, and people talk to me, maybe because of what I'm wearing, I don't know. <laughs> Eva Heldon is another curling fan getting noticed for her outfit. She's cheering on her daughter, who is part of Team Sweden. It's really fun to be here in the yellow jacket, actually, because a lot of Canadian people are coming up to us and, and saying welcome and nice to see you and, and chatting. And that's, uh, I think it's, you're very friendly here. So that's a very nice experience. <laughs> People from around the globe are in Sydney for this week's championship games. Among them are David and Morna Aiken of Scotland. They say curling is also a friendly sport back home, but that's not the only similarity to Cape Breton. Really nice scenery, and it does remind us of Scotland quite a lot. Just it's, it's a lot bigger. Bigger, bigger version of it. Everything's, everything's <laughs> a lot further away. <laughs> Joanne Hudson is a volunteer at this week's draws. She says many friendships are formed on and off the ice. The first day I was in the patch, a fellow came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder, and it was someone I used to curl with 40 years ago in Dawson City, or 38 years ago in Dawson City, Yukon, when my husband and I lived up there. And that was pretty exciting. And then I've run into people all over the place, some that I've met at Grand Slam events, and yeah, it's really fun. Hudson says in addition to watching great matches in Sydney, she hopes fans walk away feeling embraced by Cape Breton's hospitality. Aaron Potty, CBC News, Sydney. Coming up, the UN Security Council once again fails to pass a resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. At least 40 people are dead and many more injured after a mass shooting at a concert hall in Moscow. And there's a look at Shelburne on this Friday. Ryan is back next with his full weather forecast. We'll see you in just a few.
Yeah, so some wet weather headed our way, huh? Yeah, it's going to be a wet Saturday, late day Saturday. I mean, we're going to get most of the day in tomorrow uh, relatively scot-free, which is okay. good. And yeah. we'll uh, take advantage of that if you can get out and stretch your legs. Saturday morning, Sunday afternoon will also be for the most part dry. So for the... bookended with decent weather. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, really kind of the most noteworthy weather will be Saturday evening overnight into Sunday morning mm -hmm. and then again that system will uh, will kick out. Uh, so let's start with our current temperatures and you can see where yeah we've got uh, anywhere right now from uh, minus two at Inganish Beach to uh, plus two right along the Atlantic coastline including the Halifax area. Pretty nice evening out there. It really is. I mean it's chilly. It's uh, still a little on the breezy side. Sustained winds uh, 30, 40, even 50 kilometers per hour. Uh, so yeah, it is definitely uh, breezy and you can see those gusts at last check uh, still upwards of 50, 60 and at last check coming in off that Bay of Fundy uh, still at 78 at last check at Greenwood. So yeah, it is uh, really howling through here coming in off the Bay of Fundy and along that Northumberland shore region as well. Now uh, and into Cape Breton. Now, as we look at the satellite radar picture again, lovely out there this evening. Uh, this is the low that's moving its way out. And again, those breezy, uh, gusty westerly winds still in the wake of that system. And between that high and that low, that pressure gradient really forcing that wind. Now, here's that next system, which is again going to be rolling in. We already do have lace wet wind warning in effect that is for beginning tomorrow evening and into the overnight rainfall warnings in effect for the tri county area and so are wondering well why not for the rest of the region well uh, basically it's all about timing right the system not arriving until uh, really tomorrow evening into the overnight so hitting here within the 24 hour period not hitting here for within the 24 hour period. Again, that's uh, just why we have to kind of wait a little bit longer uh, for the warnings to be expanded eastward, and they will indeed be. Uh, you can see winds will become light tonight. Uh, those westerly winds, it'll take some time, though. So still windy this evening, and then uh, we'll uh, be watching those winds to ease through the overnight hours. Again, temperatures are going to be quite chilly to start the day for tomorrow. A uh, little bit milder towards tomorrow morning in through the Tri-County area. Those overnight lows will be uh, closer to the uh, freezing mark, but uh, most of us right along the coast anyway, most of us will, as you can see here, be starting pretty chilly tomorrow. Note the building clouds throughout the afternoon or, and certainly throughout the morning for the western areas, throughout the afternoon for the eastern areas and into Cape Breton. And here come those first few flakes. And so if you're traveling tomorrow afternoon, be mindful that we could see some slushy, very light accumulation plus side temperatures. So not overly concerned about the roads uh, for most of the region, but Colchester, Cumberland uh, and into the Northumberland shore region temps will be closer to the freezing mark here. Parts of the valley as well, higher terrain areas may get a little bit of a slushy coating, uh, so do be mindful of that. And uh, yeah, Cape Breton, quiet, couple of late day flakes, more like evening temperatures, two to four degrees here. Uh, we will see winds relatively light across the east tomorrow. Still a little bit breezy early on for Cape Breton. And then we are looking at those southeast winds developing ahead of our system for the Fundy and Valley region. And again, some sunshine early, early in the morning here. Uh, the building clouds and then that uh, Mixed precipitation will start to work its way in. First is flurries, then over to showers for the Tri-County area. Flurries edging into the Halifax area. Wet flurries indeed uh, for the uh, afternoon. And then here comes that, again, shower activity and those steadier periods of rain to follow. Note our temperatures here. Seven, eight, nine, double digits by overnight Saturday into Sunday morning. So very mild. Again, those winds will be gusting. And then that rain tracks through. Temperatures tumble quickly on the back side of the system. So things will turn icy here. Uh, we'll be watching uh, for that. And you can see uh, that uh, Sunday, in, obviously overnight, we're gonna be uh, really dropping off. In case you missed it earlier, mostly rain, 30 to 50 millimeters. So it is gonna be a significant shot of rain, potential for some localized flooding here. And if you are traveling to New Brunswick or PEI, be mindful that things will be uh, quite nasty there in terms of that messy, icy mix. Note the winds gusting 60, 70 and 80 kilometers per hour Saturday night into early Sunday. As I mentioned earlier, could see some gusts exceeding 80 along parts of the coast, especially Northumberland Shore, Eastern Shore, and into Cape Breton. Uh, and uh, then it's all gone. By the time we get into early next week, still watching this system kind of looming offshore early next week. Looks like Monday is quiet. Uh, Tuesday, that system will kind of back its way into the region with a bit of a icy mix risk for Tuesday with uh, unsettled weather. Spring here in the Maritimes through next <laughs> week. Amy. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for that, Ryan. Thank you.
Well, up next, I'll talk with Alan Reed, president of the Juno Awards, and I'll ask what to expect from this weekend's awards ceremony. That is our newsmaker. Stay with us. You're watching CBC Nova Scotia News. Everything's wet. Everything's always wet. I, I had my own place in Spryfield, and then my landlord decided they wanted to renovate me because they didn't like me. I'm a worker. Eh? I work on the building. That's why I stay here because I got lots of work but no place to stay. Yeah. Well, I'm tired. You can see how tired I am. I can hardly keep my eyes open. But I got a fight. I got no choice. What do I need help with? That's kind of, that's kind of, no one actually asked me the question before. I don't know. I actually don't know what I need help with anymore. The biggest celebration of Canadian music is underway in Halifax. The 53rd Juno Awards will be handed out Sunday and performances are happening across the city. 
I'm joined now by Juno's president, Alan Reed. Uh, so first of all, can you talk about what the vibe is like right now downtown? Yeah, I'm actually at the Sutton Place Hotel right across from the convention center and it is buzzing. There are people everywhere, Juno signs everywhere. Uh, you can definitely get the sense that the, uh, the party is on. It's gonna be happening very soon. Of course, the big event is the award ceremony on Sunday, but lots of other stuff happening this weekend. What are some of the highlights for you? Well, there's a brand new program we're doing called the Juno Block Party. It actually kicked off last night, uh, the East Coast uh, Maritimes celebration headline by Classified. And this is down right beside um, the um, uh, wharf. Uh, not the wharf, it's called the... Oh, I can't remember. The Waterfront uh, Warehouse. That's what it is. Sorry. Uh, we'll be down there tonight, uh, Friday and Saturday. These are free shows. You just have to register online at junowars.ca, get yourself a ticket. Tonight, we're featuring Talk, who's up for five Junos, along with Good Kid and Dizzy and local favorite Maggie Andrew. And tomorrow night on Saturday is a country night, featuring James Barker Band, Tyler Joe Miller, Dave Sampson, and many more. Well, what are you most looking forward to? Oh, the end, when it's all over. <laughs> <laughs> no, honestly, it's, uh, it is such a... It's so great to take the Junos on the road. We've been traveling for 20 years, and when we come to a city, especially like Halifax, I was saying off the top, you can feel the energy that's happening here. It's so amazing, and so, yeah, I just, I love to just sort of soak it all up and, and see what's going on, not just with the nominees are coming to town, but also with all the local musicians who are getting a chance to get out and perform. All right, well, Maestro Fresh Wes is gonna make history on Sunday when he becomes the first hip hop artist inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. Can you just talk about the significance of that? Sure, I just actually just watched Wes's rehearsal a few minutes ago. It's gonna be fantastic. Um, yes, Wes is the first rapper, first hip hopper to ever be inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. He also made history 33 years ago when he won the very first rap recording. So it's so amazing, and, and I've known Wes through his entire career, so it's pretty wonderful to be here in Halifax. The East Coast is now his adopted home, so to be <laughs> celebrating him here is, uh, is extra special. And what kind of economic impact will the Junos have for Halifax? Yeah, absolutely. On average, uh, when we've been touring for the last 10 years, we throw off about $12 million of local economic impact. You know, you think about the thousands of people who are here from all across the country, musicians, the, the record industry, publishers, promoters, managers. They're taking over hotels, they're going out for dinner, they're using Ubers and taxis. So it has a significant benefit. Um, not to mention just, you know, not from across the country, but all within the Atlantic region. All the provinces are engaged. As much as we're in Halifax, this is an Atlantic region Junos. All right, well, it sounds like quite a weekend ahead of you. Have fun and thanks so much for your time. My pleasure, great to be here. Coming up, driving an EV may save you money on gas, but a new report shows it could also mean higher insurance premiums.
Welcome back. As we told you earlier, Catherine, the Princess of Wales, has announced she has an undisclosed type of cancer. She appeared in a video released today to talk about the diagnosis and her treatment. Journalist Anna Cunningham has more from London. I wanted to take this opportunity to say thank you personally. This video statement that was released by Catherine, the Princess of Wales, will have come as quite the shock to the public here. There has been a lot of speculation, there has been concern about the princess's health, and there's also been a huge amount of misinformation being spread about on social media since she was last seen, which was on Christmas Day when she attended church with other members of the royal family in Sandringham. We knew that she had undergone abdominal surgery back in January, but Kensington Palace initially said that this was non-cancerous. Now we have been given more details directly from the princess herself. It was a very personal statement. She said that cancer cells had been found after the surgery. She also said that she was fit and well and that she's now undergoing a treatment of chemotherapy. As you can imagine, this has taken time. It has taken me time to recover from major surgery in order to start my treatment. But most importantly, it has taken us time to explain everything to George, Charlotte and Louis in a way that's appropriate for them and to reassure them that I'm going to be okay. We have had reaction from the monarch, King Charles, indeed her father-in-law, who himself is also undergoing treatment for cancer in it. He said that he was so proud of Catherine and the courage that she had shown in speaking out as she did. At this point, this will put the lid really on the speculation and the wild misinformation that has been out there about the Princess of Wales. But also what was very interesting in this statement was that she reached out to other cancer patients, people who are also receiving diagnosis and having treatment themselves. For everyone facing this disease, in whatever form, please do not lose faith or hope. You are not alone. It was quite a poignant moment and quite something to hear from a member of the royal family. Anna Cunningham for CBC News, London. Russian security officials say 40 people are dead and more than 100 wounded after an attack on a concert hall in Moscow. <laughs> It happened on the edge of Moscow as a rock concert was about to begin. Authorities say several gunmen burst in and shot at audience members. Witnesses say the attackers also threw explosives and triggered a blaze. It's unclear how many people were trapped in the burning building. Russian authorities are treating it as terrorism. And the attack comes days after the re-election of President Vladimir Putin and in the midst of its war on Ukraine. Turning to the latest from the Israel-Hamas war, the U.S. is once again trying to dissuade Israel from planned offensive against the city of Rafah in Gaza, where more than a million displaced Palestinians are sheltered. But Israel says it won't stop its fight against Hamas. It comes as yet another U.N. ceasefire resolution was vetoed today. The CBC's Chris Reyes has the details. Thank you. In Tel Aviv, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken was met with cheers of support from locals calling for an immediate hostage deal. Blinken is back in Israel meeting with Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and other leaders. The visit is his sixth to the region since the October 7th Hamas attacks, underscoring American support for its ally. But as the war in Gaza closes in on six months, the conversations between the two are evolving. We share the goal of ensuring Israel's long-term security. Uh, as we've said, though, a major military ground operation in Rafah is not the way to do it. Uh, it risks killing more civilians. On that, Netanyahu said soon after that while Israel hopes for U.S. support, it's also willing to go at it alone. The Israeli prime minister said there was no way to defeat Hamas without entering Rafah. The exchange between the two leaders happened as the U.N. Security Council voted on a U.S. resolution 
that expressed its strongest support yet for a ceasefire. This is a strong resolution, and it does more than just call for a ceasefire. It helps to make that make a ceasefire possible. The resolution failed to pass, vetoed by Algeria and two permanent members of the Council, Russia and China. The final text remains ambiguous and does not call for an immediate ceasefire, nor does it even provide an answer to the question of realizing a ceasefire in the short term. Russia condemned the U.S. for failing to include in the text opposition to further Israeli military action in Gaza. The U.S. draft contains an effective green light for Israel to mount a military operation in Rafah. Russia and China simply did not want to vote for a resolution that was penned by the United States because it would rather see us fail than to see this council succeed. On Saturday, the U.N. Security Council is expected to vote on another resolution with stronger calls for a ceasefire. Meanwhile, the Israeli defense minister is expected in Washington next week. Chris Reyes, CBC News, New York. If you drive an electric vehicle, watch out. Insurance premiums for EVs could be going up in the next few years as the insurance industry grapples with a shift from gas-powered cars to electric alternatives and their costlier claims. Philippe de Montenay explains. Benjamin Vassal and his partner never expected repairing their Tesla would take two months. We hit a deer um, at like, you know, around 90 kilometers per hour. The bumper, trunk, and headlights had to be replaced. And then we realized that the total cost was $18,000, which was really expensive compared to what we thought we, the, the car needed. So our insurance covered it. Vassal, however, fears having to dish out more for insurance down the road. And then you're thinking about the insurance policy and how it could go up because it's happening some, like everywhere else. A recent Morning Star DBRS report looked at the UK, where EV uptake is much higher than in Canada. The average cost of insurance there soared last year, up 72% for electric and only 29% for gas and diesel. The report says Canadians could see their premiums increase too. Insurance is a pool business. The uh, insurance premiums from a lot of people I used to pay claims for very few people. So right now in that pool, we have very few EVs. But that'll change, he says, as EV production ramps up in Canada and sales of conventional cars and trucks are phased out by 2035. Some electric vehicles just have higher repair costs. And that's a result of more expensive replacement parts that aren't as readily available, or also the, the skilled labor that it may take for these repairs. Some colleges are hoping to change that, offering new EV mechanics programs. At George Brown College in Toronto, enrollment is strong, showing appetite for these skills. Yeah, it's just been over a year and a half now that we've been offering the program. Um, it has almost 700 students. Vassal worries costly and complicated repairs could turn people off from electric vehicles. Just, I'm not going to go electric because of insurance policies too expensive. The couple first decided to get an electric car to save on gas, but with insurance costs being higher and charging costs going up, these savings are slowly melting away. Philippe de Montigny, CBC News, Welland, Ontario. Canada's main stock index took a breather today, closing down more than 100 points just one day after setting a new all-time closing high. Here's a look at the numbers.
All right, so a wet weekend, but not a washout. Yes. Is that, is that about right? Uh, that is perfect. Yeah. Uh, and again, the, the timing of it is for Saturday night. Right. So that's really going to be kind of nice. We'll get a good chunk of Saturday where it's not, you know, too bad. And then a pretty good chunk of Sunday, especially mm -hmm. for the western half of the province. We'll time it out one more time in case you're just joining us this evening. Let's have a look at our photo of the day. And this one, we're going to zoom in uh, to uh, the west. And I believe that's Lockerbur Lake. And you can see a beautiful oh, shot. Oh, wow. Sun pillar. Nice colors. Reflection. Heidi <laughs> it's Gould. It's got it all. It really does. A little bit of snow there. Just a light dusting. Perfect shot. Thank you, Heidi, for sharing. Ryan's picks at cbc.ca. Okay, lay sweat wind warning in effect for tomorrow evening into the overnight. Uh, rainfall warnings in effect for the Tri-County area. As we mentioned earlier, it's all about timing with this, so those rainfall warnings will be expanded uh, further eastward. At least I'm anticipating they will be based on uh, the totals that we're seeing. Again, rainfall warning criteria this time of year is still 25 millimeters uh, of rain, I believe. And so we will be looking at... Uh, uh, upwards of 30, 40, 50 millimeters of rain by the time we're set and done. The heaviest amounts, again, in and along that Atlantic coastline uh, and into the south and west. And that messy mix, if you're heading to New Brunswick or PEI this weekend, be mindful that uh, things are looking more wintry there for sure. Looking at the timeline, quiet overnight tonight into tomorrow morning. We'll see those clouds building in, and there's that snow tracking in, really ramping up through Saturday morning in New Brunswick. For us, it's uh, just some flakes, and then Saturday afternoon, we'll start to see that potential for some light accumulation for Colchester, Cumberland, and the Northumberland shore as the sun sets, and we see that uh, little wave of snow pushing through there, but that's about it for accumulation for us in terms of of the snow. There comes the rain. Note the temperatures. Sunday morning is going to be really uh, quite uh, wet and windy uh, with those uh, winds howling in from the south uh, with that uh, rain. Note the temperatures falling quickly uh, in the wake of the system and back into the low single digits by Sunday afternoon. That system will depart uh, and then a new low kind of just lurking offshore and you can see that green uh, being held at bay there for Monday, but it looks like it will back into the region on Tuesday with the potential for some showers, some flurries, and maybe even some patchy freezing rain. So keeping an eye on that setup mm. for Tuesday, Amy, and then the warm pushes in uh, further on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So uh, active through mm. next week. As you say, welcome to spring in Nova yes, Scotia. Definitely. All right. Well, a species conservation program in Bolivia appears to be taking fruit. Have a look at this. These are Andean bears, the inspiration behind the fictional bear named Paddington. But unlike the famous character, they don't have to travel as far as London or have access to marmalade. Using trap cameras, at least 60 Paddington bears have been spotted by conservationists. That's offering some hope for the population of the species considered vulnerable to extinction. Uh, they are the only species of bears uh, s uh, native to South America. They live in uh, subtropical regions from Bolivia to Venezuela. <laughs> well, that's it for us tonight. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Good night.